This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Wall Street Journal reporters Cameron McWhorter and Zusha Ellenson discuss their book, American Gun. They talk about the history of the AR-15 and how the weapon has influenced American gun culture. They are interviewed by author and journalist Paul Barrett. Thanks for joining us. I'm here today with the authors Cameron McWhorter and Zusha Ellenson to discuss uh, their new book, on the AR-15 rifle, the, the seemingly ubiquitous uh, weapon uh, that is at the center uh, of the debate over guns in the United States. It's a weapon associated with mass shootings, but much beloved by many law-abiding gun owners and gun rights advocates. Uh, the AR-15 was once banned in the United States, but now is not only legal, but is the best-selling rifle in America. Uh, Cameron, let me start with you, and uh, I'm wondering if you can pro- just provide some uh, basic sort of biographical information uh, about this uh, weapon. Yeah. What does the, what does AR-15 stand for? Uh, what does the term semi-automatic uh, mean? And what are some of the other distinctive uh, aspects of this weapon? Well, yeah, that's a, that is a, AR-15 is, is a term that everyone bandies about, but f- both sides of the gun debate don't really seem to understand. Uh, AR stands for Armalite, uh, and it was the 15th, Armalite was the small company that invented this, uh, rifle, and it was the 15th Iter- weapon that they had invented, the 15th device that they had invented. Uh, there is some debate as to whether it stood for Armalite, the company, or Armalite Research. That's 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 been discussed, but uh, it didn't stand for assault rifle, which is something that some gun control advocates have have asserted, and that drives uh, gun rights advocates nuts, but it does not stand for assault rifle. Uh, The question about semi-automatic, that is uh, somewhat complicated, uh, but I'll try to be fast with this. It is a a semi-automatic rifle is a gun that has that can fire multiple rounds but you have to pull the trigger each time an automatic rifle is a gun where you can pull down the trigger and all of the bullets in a magazine would would fire out so in the united states it it, you 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 civilian sales of ar-15s are semi-automatic which means you have to pull the trigger each time now the ar-15 is really innovative in that it, as a rifle, it came on the scene in the 1950s when it was uh, uh, developed by, again, by the small company Armalite and its inventor, Eugene Stoner. It was really considered space age and bizarre when it showed up because of, first of all, the materials that it used. Stoner used aluminum, fiberglass, plastic to make the gun lighter. His goal, his his design goal was to make a weapon that was easy to carry. The, the way it was designed, it was easy to shoot. It, it used, um, it also the way, um, I'll try to make this quick, but it's similar to electric vehicles where electric vehicles use far less parts than, uh, uh, than, than traditional uh, cars. The AR-15 uses less parts because of the way it uses the gas that is expelled from each bullet. It, it's able to use less parts. So again, it's lighter. And all those things contributed, plus the, the bullet is much smaller than, than the, the rounds that were being fired at the time by traditional uh, military rifles. So it was a much lighter gun, much easier to shoot. Soldiers could go into the field carrying much more ammunition. So that's, that's why it was, uh, that's what their pitch was to the military. All right. Uh, Zusha, uh, say a little bit more about the uh, intended use of this firearm. Uh, uh, Cameron's referred to the military. It was intended, however, it, uh, originally uh, for soldiers. Uh, what, what about it um, you know, made it uh, particularly appropriate for a, a military context? Sure. Let's start with the story of the inventor. And we'll get to that point through that. Um, The inventor is a man named Eugene Stoner, and he is a fascinating character. He was obsessed with engineering problems. He thought about them all the time. He would be out to dinner with his family at a fancy restaurant, and he would start drawing gun designs on the tablecloth. And his wife would say, 
why are you drawing gun designs on the tablecloth? And he'd say, don't worry, it'll wash out. Um, but what's interesting is that Stoner had no traditional training in firearms. He never went to college. This was just his hobby. Um, you know, as a child, he loved explosions. He built himself little pipe bombs and rudimentary rockets and cannons before the age of 10. And then, you know, when he came of age, he joined the Marines and he worked on weaponry on aircraft. And his love of firearms and devising new types of firearms really blossomed. And, uh, you know, for this story, we really wanted to get to know this guy. And thankfully, Stoner's family um, really opened up to us for the first time, gave us lengthy interviews, gave us documents about his life. I can remember walking with his daughter in Los Angeles up to the detached garage where the ideas for the AR-15 first originated. You know, he would go to work um, making aircraft valves and that sort of thing as a machinist. And at night, he would come home to his little garage. He's got prototypes. He's got drawings all over. And he would think about, how can I make a gun fire better? His, his wife, we got a hold of these unpublished interviews that his wife gave. And she talks about how he was very quiet. But if you talk to him about guns or planes, he could talk all night. And he had this unique ability to see things that people stuck in the dogma of gun design could not. I mean, people have been making rifles out of heavy wood and steel for centuries, but he looked at what was around him. He was making these aircraft parts with aluminum and he thought, why don't I try to make some of the heaviest steel parts in the rifle with aluminum instead? That was one of his first big innovations. And he continually, continually looked to improve guns continually looked to improve anything he looked at. He was a, you know, a real classic American inventor tale. I mean, he is a guy in a garage with little education thinking he can change the world. Um, and a lot of our book explores, you know, how after his idea got into the world, how after this revolutionary weapon made it into the world, what happened to it and how he lost control of it. Uh, well, who did uh, Stoner uh, envision um, as uh, the the user of this innovative weapon? Was was this designed primarily for for soldiers, for police officers, for civilians? So right. solely for the okay. military. Yeah. Go ahead, Cam. Yeah, it was for the he designed it for the military and he met uh, we have a long part of our book is a discussion of the bureaucratic hurdles he had to leap through and the and the and the obstacles that certain elements of the military presented to him to try to block his gun from being adopted because they had the military had its own rifle that it wanted to be adopted. But he, he, it was a military rifle, uh, and it served various design functions. This is, again, we're talking about the, the Cold War, in which was, as everybody, it's called the Cold War, but it was hot. There was a lot of brush fires all over the world, a lot of, uh, insurgencies taking place all over the world. And this gun was seen as the answer within certain elements of the military as an answer to the AK-47. This was going to be our light, rifle that could fire high velocity, small caliber rounds, a lot of bullets. You could carry a lot of bullets into the field, and that was its function. Uh, Zusha, say a little bit about uh, the use of AR-15 style rifles um, in Vietnam, which I believe, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is the, the main conflict where this um, weapon really came to the fore. Absolutely. So as we said, Stoner designed this rifle. Um, the specifications were really at the request of a general named Willard Wyman, who was worried about the proliferation of AK-47s around the world that were be carrying by, you know, being carried by communist guerrillas. And so, as Cam noted, they needed a lightweight rifle that could fire lots of ammo. And as uh, Vietnam ramped up, they realized they needed a lot of guns very quickly. And unfortunately, what happened was that the military bureaucracy in charge of getting Stoner's rifle into production made a lot of different tweaks to the gun. And we really get into this in the book very deeply. Um, you know, we, we searched through uh, documents, thousands of documents at the National Archives and various presidential libraries to look at what the military was doing when they changed 
um, this gun. One of the major changes they made was the type of ammunition uh, that was fired. And in the end, that had really tragic results. Um, once the gun got to Vietnam, there were guys in the heat of battle who we interviewed who all of a the sudden, their guns stopped working. Um, there is an incredible story of a guy that Cam interviewed and, you know, he's attacked, you know, he's in there in the jungle there getting attacked. His gun won't work and he has to kill his enemy. The only way he could with a gun that wouldn't work was with by hitting the guy with the butt of the rifle and jamming the barrel through the guy's eyes. It's just frightening and chilling. And so this became, you know, it grew and grew as Soldiers wrote home to their parents saying this rifle's not working. You know, my friends are dying on the field here uh, with jammed rifles in their hands. And this became a big scandal that eventually Congress held hearings on. Um, and uh, Cameron, how is this situation uh, resol- resolved? Well, that's a that's again, we go into this in the book. But really, I think uh, on one level, it was never resolved because the Tet Offensive and the Vietnam War took over and the military was more than ready to move on from this uh, debacle. The military certainly tried to repress this information uh, that the guns were jamming uh, during the Vietnam War. But families, you know, as as Zush pointed out, Marines and soldiers were writing home to their families saying, my God, send me cleaning equipment, send me another gun, help me. My friends have been killed. And so that erupted immediately into a congressional crisis. Congress did investigate it and try to come to some kind of conclusion where they could find out who was responsible for making those specific changes. But uh, Vietnam War overtook everything, the Tet Offensive particularly, and everybody scurried away. And so the military made significant improvements to the guns um, and also helped soldiers with training and with cleaning equipment and so then they moved on. So what came out of Vietnam was a uh, an AR-15, and we should note that the military designation of the fully automatic, you know, the gun that could fire full automatic uh, of the AR-15 was called the M16, uh, which would people have probably heard of. That rifle was far superior to to the one that they initially had ramped up production of. So a lot of the problems have been resolved, but the stigma of Vietnam and that rifle continued on. And certainly many, many veterans who came home hated that gun. I interviewed veterans who still hate that gun. And certainly among gun owners at the time in America, this strange looking rifle was considered bizarre and uh, was not the rifle that they wanted to purchase. Sales were very anemic. Uh, Zusha, um, uh, what, was someone uh, getting rich as a result of the military's uh, adopting this rifle? Who who was making uh, the weapon? Uh, who was you know who was uh, profiting from it? Uh, did, did Eugene Stoner end up being a, a zillionaire? What what happened on the economic side? The economic story is one of the most fascinating parts of our book, um, both at the beginning and towards the end, where we talk about the business of selling commercial AR-15s. At the very beginning, uh, Eugene Eugene Stoner worked for a startup called Armalite. They were a subsidiary of Fairchild. And um, what's what's amazing is the guy, he, the guy who hired him is this relentless pitchman, this real oily salesman named George Sullivan. And Sullivan tries to get Stoner numerous times to sign away the rights to his patent. He patented this novel gas system that's inside the AR-15 and M-16. And several times he tried to get him to sign it away for basically a song. And Stoner's wife would be so angry. She said, you can't do that. You have to let a lawyer look at this. Um, Eventually, uh, word made it up to, uh, you know, the the higher ups there at Fairchild and they reprimanded George Sullivan and they made sure that Stoner did get some royalties. But, what happened was that Armalite did not make very much progress selling this unique rifle to the military. And so they sold the patent rights, the rights to the gun to Colt, 
venerable old gun company that everyone knows about in America. So at the time of the Vietnam War, when they were ramping up production, it was Colt who was making all the money. And you can you can see in the story why this is important, because at the time they're ramping up, there's we looked in these declassified documents and a lot of people raised concerns about the switch of ammunition um, from IMR propellant to ball propellant. Stoner had designed it for IMR, not ball. And there are documents that say we're worried that the gun is not working with this new propellant. Um, Stoner, we found a document that's declassified where Stoner talked to people working on the M16 project. And he said, you should not change the propellant. It's going to cause trouble. But Colt was eager to make a lot of money and the military was eager to get a lot of rifles. And so they gave testing waivers to Colt, which is just mind blowing. Um, You know, they weren't really testing these guns that they were sending over to Vietnam. Um, But yes, Colt certainly did very well at the time on its military contract. Um, Before we uh, sort of move over to how the uh, AR-15 became so prevalent in civilian hands, um, let me ask another question about uh, the military context, Cameron. Uh, do American soldiers today use some variant of the AR-15, yes. some descendant of it, or, or do the rifles that that our soldiers uh, carry into battle uh, resemble the AR-15 in any uh, notable ways? Yeah, I mean, among uh, gun experts, the term is sort of plat- the platform. The AR platform is used to this day uh, with M4s and uh, and variants of M16s. You can see them all the time uh, in... Uh, our, our troops carried them in Afghanistan. Afghan troops carried them. Now they're in the hands, I guess, of the Taliban. But, but the, these, this, this type of rifle is used across the world, uh, by our forces and, uh, and many others now. Okay. And Zushi, there, you made passing reference earlier to the, uh, AK-47, which is, you know, sort of the, the other, uh, you know, dominant platform uh, used in uh, lightweight uh, military uh, applications uh, around the world. Uh, is one firearm better than the other? What, what, what uh, characteristics do they share and how are they, how are they different? Sure. Well, that's like a Ford versus Chevy debate that's never going to be resolved. <laughs> right. But we can speak about the various aspects of each gun. Um, What everyone will tell you about the AK-47 is that it's extremely rugged and durable. You know, there are stories of people burying AK-47s underground and digging them up years later and being able to fire them. Um, Now, the tolerances on the AK-47 are much loose. It's put together much more loosely, which makes it durable, but also, you know, makes it not such a precision weapon. It's not as precise, not as easy to aim as the AR-15 M16. Now, Stoner's gun on, you know, for contrast, is more, you know, it's more finely manufactured, um, certainly aim better. It's, but it's also, some people say, a little more finicky if you get dirt and grime in there. But these two guns certainly stand as probably the two most important rifles of the last century. Uh, and before we leave Eugene Stoner uh, behind uh, in the, the mists of history, um, let, let me raise something which uh, is not central to your the story that you're telling, but I think is uh, striking enough that viewers um, would be interested to know. You, you describe Stoner very vividly as someone who did not have a vast technical background in designing guns in particular and was, you know, largely sort of an unschooled, intuitive uh, inventor. And it strikes me as as fascinating that much the same can be said about uh, the Austrian man who invented the what I would see as the handgun analog to the AR-15 platform, namely the Glock, um, which is named after its inventor, Gaston Glock, um, who uh, you know had not been in the gun industry, um, was a, a, an engineer who who helped run a, a factory, um, and through a strange series of circumstances, ended up designing a new, very uh, innovative weapon, and innovative in many of the same ways that the AR-15 was innovative use of new lightweight material, particularly uh, uh, plastic, uh, large ammunition capacity, um, much simplified when compared to uh, then existing uh, competitive 
uh, firearms um, and something that was initially designed for the military, but then became very uh, prevalent uh, among civilian gun owners in the United States and, and elsewhere. Uh, I'm sure you came across the Glock in your uh, in your research and would invite uh, you, Cameron, you know, to elaborate a little bit on, on what uh, what I've just mentioned. No, I mean, we, we've both read your book, of course, uh, and we've uh, where we learned all about uh, the Glock's origins. And I think there is a lot of similarity. I think that and, and let's let's stick with the inventor. Like, that's the interesting thing. Like, in many regards, this gun today, everyone's fighting over it in the as you pointed out at the beginning. It's this political chew toy. We're all uh, anybody on on whatever, wherever you fall in the gun debate, people know that symbol now and, and and take it and use it either pro or con but the inventor had no you know was was just sort of the classic american inventor just trying to and in your case uh, someone from europe but but just a guy trying to make it with really uh, no expectation that he was going to become well known or make a lot of money but just obsessively trying to figure out, here's a device, how do I make it work better? And that is a, in, in researching this book, as a journalist, I realized I am not an engineer. I don't have an engineer's mind, but I came to really respect that thought process, that there's, there's some people in this world who are just thinking, they look at an object and they don't just look at an object and and that's, you know, they use it. They look at an object and they think, how could it be better? How could it be more efficient? And Stoner was certainly one of those people. He had, But he had a million roadblocks and he never, you know, he never went to college. He wasn't, he runs early in his career. He, he has uh, people questioning him where he's working, you know, well, he doesn't have a degree. I'm not, I don't know if he should work here, but he proves himself over and over again because he works harder than anyone else. And he's trying to figure out answers to questions that, that in some cases, no one's even asking. And by, by answering those questions, he shows them something they never expected. So it is an American story. Uh, but uh, as you know, from invention, once you create something, the inventor very quickly loses control of it. It goes beyond them. It's taken away from them. It becomes a commercial object or a, a, a bureaucracy takes it. And that's certainly the case with Stoner. It becomes something he makes money off of, but it's he, he can't control how it's going to be used. What strikes me as, as so fascinating in terms of the parallels between Glock and Stoner is that both of them started with a, a more or less with a blank sheet of paper. They were not trying to do the standard uh, thing with in innovation, which is to say to, to make an existing product a little bit better by refining it. Instead, they really both started from scratch in a lot of ways. And that approach, which drew a lot of skepticism initially, as you've mentioned, um, was actually an approach that led to a, a big leap forward um, in in the given uh, technology. Um, let's yeah. begin to talk a little bit about how uh, the AR-15 uh, style uh, rifles migrated from the uh, military environment to um, to other environments, and, and eventually to uh, uh, the uh, the civilian uh, marketplace. So y you mentioned earlier that. Um, Outside of the context of being sold to the uh, U.S. Army and other branches of the U.S. military, that the AR-15 uh, was not a, hu a huge commercial success in the 70s, uh, you know, post-Vietnam. Um, trace its its economic story, if you would, Zusha, or at least begin to, uh, to give us an idea of, of how it did make its way to a civilian marketplace. So as Colt was ramping up this gun for uh, Vietnam, they decided to make a civilian semi-automatic version. They named it the Sporter. It, you know, they sold it with the magazine that had five rounds. They marketed it as a superb hunting partner. Um, now, this was not unusual for Colt. They had often sold different types of weapons to the military, going back to Samuel Colt's revolver and then use the cachet of those military contracts to sell it on the civilian market. In this case, however, um, gun owners were not that excited about the Sporter, this civilian AR-15 model. 
Um, at the time, hunters, they liked their polished wood stocks. They liked their gleaming steel. They liked their large caliber for going hunting. And this gun seemed chintzy, made of plastic and aluminum. Um, the round was too small for hunting large game. So it really didn't catch on. They made a couple thousand every year throughout the 70s and 80s. And then in 1977, there was an important thing that happened, which is that Stoner's patent expired. And that opened competition for Colt. So a number of small companies started to make their own versions of the AR-15 at that time. But still, the gun did not catch on. Um, we interviewed these sort of early innovators in the gun industry, these guys who sold AR-15 style rifles, and they told us incredible stories. We spoke with Randy Luth, who started a company called DPMS Panther Arms, and he told us about how he would go to NRA conventions and display his AR-15s on the table, and NRA members would walk up to him and give him the middle finger. They did not want to see that kind of military-style gun at their conference. At the time, that was, you know, it was really a world of the sportsman and the style of gun, of shotguns, of rifles, was really sporting firearms. And this thing was new. Um, these companies that made the AR-15s at the time were really kind of outcasts in the industry. Um, there was a there's a major annual trade show called SHOT Show. It's the most important show of the year for gun makers. And the people who ran that um, would try to push these guys off to the side so they couldn't display their wares. And, you know, we spoke to gun industry executives, you know, and, and they told us that, you know, these guys were not, as they said, part of their club. They didn't like the image they projected. Now, of course, that changed dramatically. And we can talk about that next, about what changed to bring it to becoming the most popular rifle in America. Well, Cameron, why don't you just pick up the story from there and, and begin to explain that? Right. So Zusha has perfectly laid the groundwork for how we how it gets to a point where there is this group of outsiders who are selling the gun mostly to uh, collectors, special collectors, to people who are um, survivalists. There's th those are the people who are buying the gun and they're making money. But then this gun starts to take on more importance because it starts, it's pulled into the national gun debate. And that in the early nineties, it's, it starts to be pulled in with a lot of discussion about as, as there's been some, you know, a few mass shootings start to happen here and there. And this gun starts to become pulled into the discussion and Congress debates the assault weapons ban, which eventually patch it, passes in 1994. Bill Clinton signs it into law. And it, inc it includes, uh, you know, that, that whole debate focused a lot on some other guns, but the AR-15 is pulled into it and added to the ban. And that plays a critical role in turning this gun into a political symbol of the Second Amendment. Uh, and gun owners start to buy more and more of them. Now then this ban takes place. So the ban is supposedly uh, going to, you know, you couldn't buy an AR-15, theoretically. That was, that was the, that's what a ban is. Well, in fact, uh, as we show in the book, this ban really didn't work. The way it was worded, the way it was constructed, the way it was, it, it, it achieved political, uh, uh, you know, the political will necessary to pass. There were, the changes, the modifications that were required by gun companies to make these guns uh, sellable again after the ban was relatively easy. And within months, companies were back in business selling all, slightly altered versions of the AR-15. So the gun sales uh, continued throughout the ban. Uh, uh, they, they sold a lot of guns during the ban. And the whole time, it was a political symbol. So 10 years later, when the ban is lifted in 2004, uh, the, the, the ban sunsets, gun sales go through the roof. And the gun companies are right there. Uh, and uh, that's a longer story, but but these these outsider gun companies suddenly find that everybody in the gun industry wants to start making AR-15s because they're uh, as as Stoner designed it to be. It's easy to put together. The parts are relatively inexpensive, and the profit margins the gun companies discovered were extremely high. So, did the uh 
notorious or celebrated uh, assault weapons ban of 1994, which I would suggest um, when you combine it with another law passed right around the same time, the, the Brady background check law, that that was really the apogee, the high point of gun control in this country, a moment when I think a lot of people thought there was going to be even more restrictive gun control, but it turned out to be the high point. And from, you know, in, in subsequent years, actually, uh, a lot of rules were relaxed. Did that law, the the, the assault weapons ban, um, in, in effect, have the sort of the opposite uh, impact that it was intended uh, to have, Zusha? Uh, certainly, it did not much as Stoner's gun, you know, did not turn out as he had probably expected. Um, the law that the senators, Democratic senators drafted in the 90s probably did not turn out as they expected. One of the biggest impacts, as Cam noted, of this um, ban was to actually increase interest of the AR-15. Um, I spoke with a gun owner from Washington, and he talked about how he had collected guns. He had an AR-15 because, you know, he had served in the military. He liked the gun and he would go take a target shooting. He didn't think much of it. But after he saw this assault weapons ban pass in Congress and Clinton sign it, he became angry. He said, why are you telling me I can't have this gun, that I'm not responsible for this gun? Why are you blaming me for all the violence in the cities when I'm just up here in rural Washington using my AR-15 safely? And it turned it into this political symbol which, you know, increased interest. And in fact, during the 10 years that the AR-15 was banned on paper, AR-15 companies made more ARs than they had in the previous 30 years, almost mm -hmm. 900,000, which is just a remarkable um, statistic. What these AR makers found, too, was that sales of ARs really jumped in response to political events. So if there was a mass shooting and there were talk of more restrictions, gun owners would rush to buy them. There was even a big rush to buy AR-15s around Y2K, if you'll remember um, that, uh, at 90, 1999. And, and the gun companies were right there. They would ramp up production and they would sell more guns whenever there was something in the news to that effect. So, yeah, the effect of the ban was very interesting in the, insofar as it increased interest in this gun. Um, what's also interesting is that there were a lot of cultural and political um, transformations around the time that the ban lifted that really contributed to this gun becoming a huge commercial success as well. Um, you had the 9-11 attacks, and suddenly Americans saw soldiers going overseas carrying the military version of this gun, and that bad taste from Vietnam was washed out of everyone's mouth, and civilians wanted to have this gun that they saw the soldiers carrying. The assault weapons ban drops in 2004. And, you know, as Cam explained, that's really when um, the commercial market really started to flourish. Yeah. To point out, uh, just to, fascinating sorry, story, Cameron, go ahead. Yeah, just to jump in, uh, one statistic the ATF estimated there were about 400,000 assault style uh, AR 15 style rifles in this country just before the ban went into effect. And our best estimates, which are incredibly conservative, are there are more than 20 million in civilian hands today. Fascinating. So what changed politically between 1994 and 2004? Assault weapon ban uh, enacted in 94 uh, was by its own terms a de a designed to sunset or disappear 10 years later. But of course, I'm sure uh, anti-gun activists wanted to, uh, to see it renewed. Um, why did it go away? Uh, well, um, that is complicated because the gun rights movement uh, was incredibly powerful and lobbying Congress, which was by 2004, was dominated by the Republican Party. Uh, you had a Republican president. You also had the gun control movement had had this ep these episodic flourishes, but really had sort of was a lot of it, there was a lot of internal debate going on about whether the ban had been effective, whether it wasn't effective, and there was a lot of lack of political will on the part of, of gun control advocates and that gun control movement. And they really just, I mean, it just sort of fizzles out. Uh, the, uh, they just, the Congress, uh, 
was Republican dominated, but they don't take any real action. They just let it die. And, it, and each year, Democratic uh, leaders would call for it to be reinstituted, but nothing ever happens. It just sort of fades away. And the gun companies are right there uh, to ramp up production. Major gun makers jump in with their own versions of the AR-15. Again, it's out of patent. And they all jump in and market uh, uh, the heck out of the gun. And the consumers are there. Consumers are ready. Let's talk about um, uh, lawful uh, civilian uses of the gun and then unlawful uses of the gun in turn. Zushi, why don't you start by telling telling me, as the gun becomes more popular, um, as its notoriety draws people to the gun counter to to buy this rifle, what are law-abiding people doing with the gun? You you mentioned earlier that the nature of the ammunition is such that it's not terrific for hunting deer or other large game. Um, You know, you don't hunt turkeys with a a rifle like this. What what are people doing with it? Right. So, What's interesting is that what drew people to buy this gun were, for, as we talked about, um, a number of these cultural and political changes. And then when they got the gun, um, they found that it was very easy to shoot. You know, it's extreme, no, ba- barely any recoil, really easy to shoot. And they found it was endlessly modifiable. You know, it could switch out all the parts. That's how Stoner had designed it. And manufacturers would sell, you could replace the stock, you could replace the pistol grip, you could replace pretty much anything. there. And so that's why they call them Legos for adults or Barbies for men. And that became a big attraction. It's sort of like people who like to tinker with their motorcycles or cars on weekend. People really like to tinker with these AR-15s. Now, Understood. People but but actually, people drive a motorcycle, you know, to, uh, yeah. to uh, the seashore or they drive their car, uh, you know, to the grocery store to get a gallon of milk. What are people doing with the AR-15? Yeah. So uh, that's was, yeah. So about to get to that. So th- they did their first surveys of AR owners in about 2009, 2010. And this was done by the industry. And they found that the number one reason people bought AR-15s was for target shooting. So they're used for target shooting. Another major reason people bought them was for home defense, although there's quite considerable debate about whether it's the best weapon for that. And then hunting was very low on the list, but certainly some people were using them to hunt things like hogs or coyotes, other varmints. Um, But primarily it was used for target shooting. Okay. Um, I mean, the platform can be used to, you know, you can have higher caliber or larger caliber rounds. You know, they're they're now people now you can make you can alter the gun to to fire a larger bullet. So you could use it and people do use it for for hunting larger animals. But certainly the smaller round, it would be absurd to to hunt a deer, for example, with a with the small caliber. Okay. Um what aspects of of the the rifle uh, make it uh, so lethal? I mean, it's not necessarily the ammunition, as you're pointing out. Um, so, what what about it makes it you know ver- a very potent weapon? Um, Cameron, well, it, yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, the small caliber. We go into this extensively in the book, but the small caliber, you would think. It's just sort of, you know, here's a big bullet, here's a small bullet. Who's going to hurt? What's going to hurt me more? The answer, ironically, in some cases can be the smaller bullet if it's fired at a high velocity. Uh, Because as Stoner discovered, when you fire that bullet and it hits the human body, a larger bullet will, because of its, its momentum and its size, will just punch through a body, which can be very uh, problematic, obviously. But a smaller bu- caliber bullet, like the one fired by an AR-15, tends to go unstable as soon as it hits the body and yaw and spiral in throughout the body, uh, splinter, and cause a lot of damage. So that became a selling point to the military, was that this weapon, these smaller bullets, you think that they're going to not do as much harm, but in fact, once they hit a human body, they can cause a great deal of damage. And that is certainly what we've found uh, horrifically with the mass shootings that have taken place. And we profile some of the victims of some of the mass shootings. We spent a whole chapter on on one person, uh, Valerie, and she 
you know, she was injured in in the San Bernardino shooting, uh, shot twice, once in the pelvis, once in the shoulder. And that uh, absolutely changed her life. We focused on a person who'd survived, Valerie, and she goes through more than 60 operations. They are uh, her whole life is altered by these two tiny bullets and the damage that they cause. So they are incredibly destructive when they hit the human body. Heartbreaking story, it sounds like, um, and, and one well worth worth uh, telling. So if if mass shooting in a, num- in, in a very important way brings um, AR-15s to the fore, it did so in the early 90s because the concern about uh, – the trend toward mass shootings is what motivated Congress in the first place to uh, uh, pass uh, a, a, uh, an assault weapons ban. Um, and obviously today, um, while mass shootings are still statistically uh, a small part of the carnage uh, wrought by guns uh, in our country, um, they are certainly the most visible uh, uh, you know, misuse of firearms that causes people a lot of anxiety. Uh, have mass shooters, in fact, um, used uh, AR-15 style rifles uh, in a statistically distinctive way? And and what would draw somebody who has the the horrible uh, aspiration to kill a lot of people in public? Um, what would draw such a person to this particular firearm, Zusha? That is a great question. It's, you know, a very heavy, somber thing to talk about, but it's important to talk about. And what's interesting is that before 2012, you know, just a small fraction of mass shootings have been carried out with AR style rifles. But beginning in 2012, with the mass shooting at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, mass shooters really start to gravitate to this weapon to the point where in the last couple of years, about half of all mass shootings where four or more people are killed in a public place, the shooters have used. Um, AR style rifles. Now, what draws these individuals to use the guns in their attacks? Um, I need to paint a little picture of who these people generally are. Um, They generally are men. They're generally very isolated. They're often suicidal. And according to forensic um, psychologists and criminologists, they are seeking to go out with a bang, you know, in infamy and lash out at the world as they die. And so many of them choose the AR-15. Now, why is that? We read the writings of some of these killers, and I'm not going to mention their names because it's not worth mentioning them. But some of them were drawn to the tough martial look of the gun. They thought it made them, you know, made them feel like a man, some of them said. Um, others are drawn more to the capabilities of the weapon. Uh, there's a big trend where these mass shooters want to draw as much attention to themselves in their attacks. And so the way they see about doing that is by killing as many people as possible. And they believe that this gun can can do that for them. And the, the last part of this is they all study each other. These mass shooters, you know, the, the shooter in Sandy Hook, one of the worst mass shootings in our nation's history, where an elementary school was attacked. He, he studied these mass shootings extensively. He had a spreadsheet of every mass killing going back to the 1800s with details about the shooter, the type of weapon they used, how many people they killed. And so there is a real copycat effect that started to occur after 2012. And, you know, by the time you get to the Parkland school massacre, which was terrible, awful attack in Florida, there's almost kind of a a performative aspect to this. The shooter there, he gets an AR. He listens to a song that sort of references mass shootings. He makes YouTube videos saying he's going to be the next school shooter. And so they're all trying to copy each other in this really sort of grim game of one-upsmanship. Um, and that, so that is what has attracted these people to this gun. Obviously, these people are not very rational, and the choices they might make are, are different than most other people. But for some reason... Um, they've been attracted to it. And and on top of that, let me just add, the gun is widely available. It's easy to buy anywhere. And as we found in our research, most of these mass shooters are able to go buy the gun legally. As you know, many of our gun laws are 
designed to stop criminals from buying guns. You know, you go, if you're a felon, you can't buy a gun at a gun store. But most of the mass shooters don't have criminal records, which raises a really interesting problem for us as a society. How do we stop these young, isolated, suicidal, angry young men from walking into stores and legally buying AR-15s? Uh, Cameron, I wonder if there's just one more factor worth mentioning here. Sometimes it, it's, it's such a simple factor that I think sometimes people overlook it. Um, ammunition capacity. Um, could you address that and why the AR-15 style weapon um, and would be, would be appealing to someone whose uh, you know, uh, evil uh, ambition is just to kill a whole bunch of people really quickly? Right. I mean, magazine size. Well, we'll, let's go back to the the design principles that Stoner embraced for the military. He the the large, you know, relatively large magazines. uh, You could carry a lot of ammunition and fire it quickly and easily. You know, the kid who who I'm not going to mention in in Uvalde, Texas, had not fired a gun before that day. And he walks in and wreaks that havoc. The there you are able to fire a lot of rounds really quickly, and it's really easy to shoot. People, it has this martial look. Uh, people think it's this. You know, people who aren't familiar with guns think it's uh, this monstrous gun. It's very easy to shoot. So if you're a young, disturbed person who wants to hurt a lot of people really quick, quickly, the AR-15 is perfect for that. Now, right. And also, uh, yeah. it, it, you have 30 rounds in, in the magazine, or sometimes even more. Uh, you don't have to reload uh, so quickly, so that makes it a, a really efficient right. killing machine. Right. I mean, we had, you know, the the shooting in Dayton uh, several years ago, that, that shooting, uh, the was outside of a a bar. Uh, a man started shooting his AR-15 style pistol, and there were police right there with AR-15s, and they killed him within 30 seconds. But he was still able to kill a bunch of people because it's so easy to shoot. Uh, and as Zush pointed out, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So uh, the current uh, regulatory environment is is a complicated one, as as you both have explained. Um, we actually have less gun control, less gun regulation at the federal level um, than we had uh, in the 1990s during the, the assault weapons ban and its effective period. Um, but there have been some states that have taken action uh, to ban or restrict uh, certain types of firearms. Could you, uh, Zusha, uh, address that vis-a-vis the AR-15? Uh, you know, in particular, I, I can't own an AR-15 in every single state in the United States, right? I mean, it's a, it's a complicated a complicated political map. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how this country deals with the issue of mass shootings and guns as it deals with everything else, which is we see a real splitting of the country. You see liberal states moving to restrict AR-15s and you see um, red states, you know, conservative states looking to loosen gun laws, you know, passing constitutional carry and so forth. Now, in these states that have restricted the AR-15, a lot of these um, bans also have the same issues that the federal ban has. So I live in California, for instance, and even though AR-15s have been banned on paper since 1989, you can still walk into a a gun store and buy an AR-15. It looks a little different, and you can't buy any magazines that hold more than 10 rounds either. So that's a little different. But even in these uh, states, you know, it's not the majority of states, certainly. Um, even as these handful of states that ban this gun, you can still um, buy the AR-15. Now, there are other measures that are being taken on the state level that have a little more bipartisan support, which are these things called red flag laws. And these, this law targets the individual and not the firearm, and it allows authorities to seize weapons from people who are threatening mass shootings or threatening to kill themselves. And this is a more surgical approach than, you know, sort of blunt approach of the assault weapons ban. Um, Initially, it did have support from conservatives and Democrats, but now it has also become somewhat partisan. Um, Are there other approaches to uh, regulation that are promising aside from the red flag laws and the at the moment, a very unrealistic prospect of trying to ban categories of weapons at the national level? What else is going on? 
Uh, well, we've discussed this in the book, but there are people trying different things on monitoring. You know, as Zusha mentioned, a surgical approach seems to be where a lot of people are starting to think regarding the AR-15, because with more than 20 million in this country and them easily available for purchase, uh, you know, the vast majority of people who own AR-15s are not out to hurt anybody, uh, as uh, because as one AR-15 advocate said to me, if we were all psychos, you'd all be dead. So, uh, you know, most gun owners have their guns and aren't out to hurt anyone. But the biggest question is, how do we keep that this gun, which is so easy to fire so many rounds so quickly, out of the hands who people who from of people who want to hurt other people, and that is going to take uh, efforts. There's some discussion. Some school systems are starting to monitor people who are their social media feeds if they've expressed violence uh, or you know ideations of of committing violence. There are various things people are doing to try to sort of find out. Way, raising the age limit, perhaps, so that younger men would have have to wait to purchase a, a gun like the AR-15. There are things that are being tried, and I think, getting back to the engineer's mind that that I talked about earlier, I think that's really where people on the cutting edge of this problem, which we all face, it, are starting to think that we're going to have to. Ha- approach it like an engineer. We're going to try this. We're going to try this. It's not about whether it's conservative or liberal. It's just we're going to try different things and see what works to make our country safer. Uh, on the uh, issue of making the country safer, Zusha, is the, are AR-15 style rifles uh, being used in more garden variety uh, crimes? Is, is it a, a common weapon in the hand of uh, stick up artists, um, drug gangs and so forth? You know, so the vast majority of murders in our country are carried out with handguns. And, you know, criminals prefer handguns because they're easily concealable. So people getting robbed, you know, drug shootouts, those are most frequently carried out with handguns. And that's, you know, a huge topic that must be addressed, but that's not the focus of our book. Um, in terms, there is what's interesting, though, however, is that there, you know, ARs are, because they're so popular, are starting to be used a little more um, in gang warfare, warfare and so forth. But still, the vast majority of murders are being carried out with handguns. Uh, Cameron, does the, does the AR-15 make sense as a home de- uh, defense weapon? I mean, it seems to me that's one of the strongest arguments that gun rights advocates have, which is to say, I'm a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. Um, I want to protect my family, my property. So I have a, you know, a, a firearm in the front hall closet, and you you shouldn't be able to tell me not to have that type of weapon. Um, is the AR-15 uh, useful in that regard? Well, that is a, a lot of people will debate fiercely about that. There are many gun owners that I spoke to would prefer to have a shotgun uh, for something Why like that, that or a handgun, you know, I mean, uh, because it because you don't have to focus, you know, you don't have to target, you just open fire on who's coming through the door. Uh, but there have been instances that uh, gun rights advocates will tout uh, where there have been instances where someone's breaking into a house and a person takes the air, you know, a home, uh, someone's defending their home with an AR-15. It has happened. The question becomes, uh, is it the most useful weapon for home defense. And that uh, is fiercely debated. Uh, there is, uh, it would be, uh, I don't, you know, I mean, it's kind of, uh, some people will say fiercely yes, some people will say no. But the, but the bottom line, which you pointed out at the beginning of your question, which is, there are people who say, I have a right to own this rifle. And you are, cannot impinge upon that. Therefore, I'm going to go buy it and I'm going to have it in my house. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll, since we're coming close to uh, wrapping up this uh, fascinating conversation, um, uh, let's raise the, the question of the, the right to own a gun, which obviously uh, is derived from the Second Amendment uh, to the Constitution, which protects the right to, quote, keep and bear arms, close quote. Um, that right has actually uh, expanded uh, markedly in just the, the last uh, year or two as the U.S. Supreme Court, now dominated by conservative justices has reinterpreted the uh, the right and 
and reinterpreted how uh, the courts will review efforts at gun control and uh, examine whether they are consistent with the Second Amendment. There was a case from New York State. It did not involve an AR-15, but the, the, the case that flowed from it will, will affect all uh, gun regulations and uh, of all types of guns. The case is called Bruin. And um, I'm wondering if, if either of you would, would care to address how that, may, how that case, which said that um, laws re- regulating guns will be upheld, are valid uh, only if they fit with uh, the history and tradition of gun regulation in this country, meaning that if a, a judge cannot find an analog at the time of the founding of the, of the country um, to the law in question, uh, the law today must fall. And um, we're beginning to see that this ruling has had uh, a really striking effect and gun regulations are being struck down left and right across the country. Um, how will this affect the AR-15 um, debate, do you think, uh, Zusha? Yeah, so certainly the courtroom is going to play a huge role in the future of the AR-15 in our country. On, on the one side, have you, as you said, the Supreme Court has really expanded Second Amendment rights in this country, and gun rights advocates are really confident that they are going to get the Supreme Court to strike down a state assault weapons ban at some point. I know a lot of these bans, you know, in California, Illinois, and elsewhere are being challenged in the courts, and gun rights advocates are hoping that the Supreme Court takes this up with the, with its conservative majority, and they feel confident that they will be overturned. So that may bode, you know, well for gun rights groups, and it may bode that these guns will be more widely available. On on the other hand, what's interesting is on the civil side, uh, you've seen some progress made by gun control groups. Um, for instance, the, the families um, of the who lost children and teachers at Sandy Hook Elementary School, uh, they sued a gun, the gun maker, Freedom Group Remington, called different names, uh, for the way they marketed the AR-15 that was used in that attack. And they ended up getting one of the largest settlements on record, um, some $73 million dollars, um, and certainly that's had an effect on the way that AR-15s are marketed. And we're watching closely to what's, what happens in civil litigation. You know, will there be more settlements like that? Will they be thrown out by the courts? So you have these two tracks. You have, you know, uh, cases being brought up to the Supreme Court and you have the civil litigation against gun makers. And it will be interesting to see what happens going forward. All right. Well, this has been a really terrific conversation. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Um, congratulations on the publication of your book. Good luck with it. And I think uh, people will be well served uh, to learn more about the AR-15, its history, uh, and so forth. And I think this book is a great place to go. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Paul. Great talking to you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for listening to the Afterwards podcast. We want to make sure you know about our latest podcast, Books That Shaped America. It's a companion podcast to our 10-week television series of the same name. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress and selected 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact. This companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about books that shaped America, go to our website, c-span.org. The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.